Why do these people think that God is paying special attention to the U.S., considering that there are child soldiers in Africa, war in Ukraine, and China? That's a good question. Let me show you. Let me show you. I'll show you from the words of a televangelist, from the words of an evangelical themselves. This will put into perspective for you how these people view America and why they believe that America was specially chosen by God. This is Shane Vaughn. He is a televangelist nutcase that believes that Trump is the new messiah, basically. This clip is from early November 2021. And he wrote down, wow. we are going, he wrote a course, to new Israel, new Israel, new Israel. And when they came off the ship, they didn't plant an American flag. They planted the Christian flag mm -hmm. on the soil. They dedicated, George Washington knelt and prayed, dedicated America where the twin towers stand or stood. That's where America came into covenant with Yahweh, with God, was where the twin towers stand. Wow. Ain't that something? That is where George Washington prayed. Not true. Any of it. Revisionist history at best. Delusion at worst. This is why they believe that America is so special. This is why they think America is what God is paying the most attention to. Because they believe that God made a covenant with America as the new Israel. In the Old Testament, the Israelites made a covenant with Yahweh and agreed that he would protect them in exchange for their exclusive worship, blah, blah, blah. They believe the exact same thing happened when America was discovered with like Christopher Columbus and his whole group and the, the, the pilgrims and all that. Complete nonsense. None of it is true. Like, down to the details that he's giving us, not even the details are true. Like, George Washington knelt down where the Twin Towers were. No, no, none of that. He didn't pray in front of the Twin Towers or whatever else. It's all nonsense. There's a chapel right outside the Twin Towers where George Washington, that picture of him. I believe that's called St. Paul's Chapel. I uh, could be wrong on that. Yeah, I read about that in specifically because I was trying to get a tour guide's license to give tours in New York City. Figured I'd give tours to fans. Thought that'd be awesome. Still want to do that. I was waiting for COVID to get a little better. I may still do it. We'll see. But anyway, that's beside the point. I don't remember anything about George Washington kneeling in front of St. Paul's Chapel with his horse and praying to God and all that. It's all nonsense. This is all complete nonsense with little bits of truth thrown in here or there. Like, yeah, there is a chapel there. That's true. That's like the only true thing in this entire sentence. And it prayed, right? There's a chapel right outside the Twin Towers where George Washington, that picture of him praying by the horse, that's where it happened. That picture of George Washington praying by his horse, this picture right here, it's fake. It never happened. This is a fabrication. It's historical revisionism. It's not real. But here we have Shane Vaughn describing a scenario that fits the historical narrative behind this painting. The events that took place in this painting never happened. What Shane Vaughn is describing here never happened. It's nonsense from top to bottom, but it doesn't matter. These people don't care if it's real or not. They know it's not real. They're the ones making it up. As long as it fits their narrative, as long as they can convince gullible suckers, they'll say it. Chapel right outside the Twin Towers where George Washington, that picture of him praying by the horse, that's where it happened. That's where he dedicated our nation in covenant to God. If you will make us a great nation, deliver us from tyranny, then we will serve you. And he gave the nation to God at that point. Every signer that, of the Declaration of Independence were descendants of the tribes of Israel. Israel. We can trace it, we know it. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were direct descendants from the tribes of Israel. That's what he just claimed. Delusion or grift? I don't know. I can't tell. It's so hard to know for sure one way or another. That's simply not true in any way at all. I mean, I have to imagine he just made it up, right? Maybe he claims that God gave him this information secretly in the dead of night, spoke to him and said, Shane, the founding fathers are descendants of the tribes of Israel. 
theologically, it doesn't make sense because you don't have to be a descendant of the 12 tribes of Israel to get into God's kingdom or to be in covenant with God or whatever, right? According to Christianity, you don't have to be related to the Jewish people for that to be the case. So theologically, it's nonsense. Historically, it's nonsense. I mean, just it's nonsense all the way around from top to bottom. It's made up nonsense, made up by Shane. I was a doctor of theology. No. No, you weren't. You were not a doctor of theology, Shane. This is just straight up bizarre. Now he's just now he's just lying. Like everything out of his mouth is false right now. I haven't picked out a single true thing out of his mouth yet except for that mention that there's a chapel next to where the twin towers were. That's the only true thing in this whole thing that I've picked out. The doctor of theology I was the youngest ordained evangelist in America at 14 years old. Wow. Is 14 the youngest that anyone has ever been an ordained minister? I'm skeptical. I feel like this is, you know, verifiable information that we could just look up and find out. This is yet another lie. The youngest ordained minister was ordained at four years old. Hugh Marjo Ross Gortner, also known as Marjo. At this time, I would like to present to you the world's youngest ordained minister and the world's youngest evangelist, Marjo Gortner. God, for my God and Christian mother, that pregnant me to Jesus. If we had more good Christian mothers that would teach the boys and girls how to play more instead of drinking cocktails and smoking filthy old cigarettes, we would have a better America. He eventually went on to leave evangelicalism and teach people all the underhanded tricks and scams televangelists use to manipulate people. There's, there's one guy that gets into it so heavy that he's into, he prophesies. And he told me how he did it. He sat right, I mean, he looked right across the table back and forth at me. And, and he told me how, you know, how he confiscates money. He says he's on, this station is over 40 states. And, uh... He'll go on there and he'll get on the radio and he'll say, I know that listening to my little voice tonight, that there's some lady out there and you've got $10 put away in a cookie jar. Now God spoke to my heart and told me to go and tell you to get that $10 and get it in the mail and send it to me and God will bless you. God will give you a reward such as you have never known before. And then he comes back to me and he tells me, he says, if you're on the radio and you're going over 40 states and you're on at prime time, you've got thousands of people listening, the chances are that there are at least two or three hundred little old ladies who've got a ten dollar bill in a cookie jar and so if you even get you know if a couple hundred go over and get it and send it to you that's two grand that you've made just like that shane vaughn was not the youngest ordained minister the youngest ordained minister was four not 14. wow i've lived for the lord my whole life and i was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it at 40 years old because i thought that a jew meant israel and an israel meant jew until I started studying my Bible, and I found out that the first mention of the word Jew in the Bible is them fighting against Israel. What? Just, I don't even know, dude. I don't even know. This is standard doctrine in a lot of ways. A lot of them believe that America is in covenant with Yahweh. They think that they're connected to God, and God cares about this government the most, and that, I mean... Rusty Bowers was testifying in front of the January 6th committee not too long ago and specifically said in front of the January 6th committee in the hearing, he said he believed that the Constitution was divinely inspired, that God inspired the founding fathers to write the Constitution and sign it, just like when Moses wrote the books of like Genesis and Exodus or whatever else, exactly the same way. Anything that would say to me, you have a doubt, deny your oath, I will not do that. And on more than, on more than one occasion throughout all this, that has been brought up, and it is a tenet of my faith. that the Constitution is divinely inspired of my most basic foundational beliefs. And so for me to do that because somebody just asked me to 
is foreign to my very being. I, I, I will not do it. Just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the Gospels. Of course, Moses didn't write those books, and neither did Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That's beside the point. The point is, they believe the Constitution to be divinely inspired by God, like the Bible. Seriously. If they live in a different reality than the rest of us, and they'll do anything they can to take power. Anything. Because they believe that God wants them to. Disturbing stuff. I grew up evangelical and was told repeatedly that there's a covenant between God and the U.S. Never in that much of detail, though. Yeah, it is a common belief. There's a covenant between the U.S. and God. And it's becoming an even more common belief that Trump is like a new messiah that, that's acting on that covenant or whatever. Absolutely deranged stuff, man. Deranged stuff. Hello, this is Madison from Texas. Big fan, as always. So my question is, this whole Roe versus Wade thinking that they're going on and thinking of putting away basically is crazy. And it always astounds me that Christians are against it. After all, God killed his son. Why can't I if I want to? Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, this voicemail actually is from like May, I think, but they were talking about it at the time. Because the draft leaked, and now it's officially been removed, unfortunately. We're in a bad position in our country right now, a disturbing place. I feel like the best argument against this whole thing, from a biblical perspective, comes from the account of bitter water in the Bible. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but this is Numbers 5, 11 to 31. This is the test for an unfaithful wife. I'll give you the cliff notes. Basically, if you think your wife has been unfaithful, you take her to the priest. The priest mixes up this solution they call bitter water. They give the bitter water to your wife. If the baby is aborted, then she was unfaithful and you won't have somebody else's son. If the baby isn't aborted, if the baby survives the bitter water, it is your son and you can keep it anyways. Your wife was not unfaithful. That's the bottom line behind this, Numbers 5, 11 to 31, and my reason for saying the Bible is in favor of abortion. The Bible's in favor of abortion. Elective abortion, as a matter of fact. People can choose to do this if they want. They don't have to. And as a matter of fact, the Jewish faith, modern Jewish faith, believes in the right to have an abortion for any reason, basically. For the physical or mental health of the mother or whatever else. There are a bunch of different reasons. So Christians are not only violating other people's religious freedoms by removing abortion rights, but they're also directly contradicting the Bible. The Bible is in favor of abortion. I don't know where people got the idea it wasn't. It is. But here we are. You know, these people don't care. They don't actually read or believe anything in the Bible. They believe what they believe already, and they search through the Bible for already existing verses that support their beliefs that they already hold. Emily Christina 41, the Bible also says life begins at the first breath. That's true. That's a good point. It does say that. It was never about moral consistency or any of that. It was always about control. Uh, hi, uh, I'm, I'm B. I'm from Missouri. Uh, you were, I'm an ex-Mormon, and you were a big part of uh, my deconversion, like, ages ago. But I wanted to know, like, with your deconversion, how did you find um, where your genuine personality started and the cult programming stopped? Because that's just things that keep happening in my head. Uh, thanks. Love your show. Love what you do. Love the work you do. Uh, bye. I appreciate that. This is a really interesting question, because... When you are indoctrinated into a cult, the cult replaces what they call the authentic personality. This is part of the process. They replace your authentic personality with the cult personality or what they call the new personality. Jehovah's Witnesses call it the new personality or the Christian personality. I mean, a lot of different groups have terms for this, but the bottom line is... They're trying to turn you into a de facto clone of the other members of the group, right? That's why all Jehovah's Witnesses seem to act similarly to each other. You ever seen a vacant smile in a cult member's face? They all have the vacant smile. 
They all have the glassy eyes that appear when they start talking about their religion. They're effectively turning people into robots for their group. And it's been like this since the dawn of time. I mean, you can watch documentaries on Heaven's Gate and and listen to them speak about their group and what they believe in everything and watch their eyes glaze over and, and just an empty smile appear on their face. That's the cult personality asserting itself. So the question is, how do you regain your authentic personality? I was born into Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm guessing that you were born into Mormonism. We never had authentic personalities. Our personalities were formed out by the church from day one, unfortunately. Some people join their groups later in life and have the opportunity to regain what they lost at the hands of their group. In our case, we have no real choice but to explore in new directions, make ourselves a little bit uncomfortable, find hobbies that we may not think we'd be interested in, experiment with things, try new foods, try new everything, figure out who you are and what you enjoy, and do everything you can to throw off the old new personality that you no longer have with you. It's important to heal from the trauma that this group has forced upon you. So do everything you can to experiment and and try new things and just have a good time. And don't worry about what the cult would want or what you think the cult would want anymore. Find yourself. It's not easy to do, but it is possible in my experience. Hello, Owen. I'm Tia from Indiana, and I'm curious as to what Jehovah's Witnesses, both children and adults, do for fun. It seems like with every Caleb and Sophia video they put out, whenever the children, they play with something, they're either scolded for it, they have it taken away, or they cut them off and try to skew them back towards the religion. And we've never really seen the adults do anything for fun either. So I'm just curious... What do Jehovah's Witnesses do for fun to pass the time when they're not at church? Thank you. It's an interesting question. Um, It depends on how spiritual you are. The more spiritual among us would read Watchtower magazines or read the Bible. But my family, we were on the less spiritual end of the congregation. We were kind of viewed as pariahs a little bit or outcasts to some degree because we weren't as invested or it didn't appear at face value that we were as invested as others were. So our go-to thing to have fun wasn't reading the Bible. When I was a kid, when my family generally, when I was younger, would watch TV, we were really into computers, and this is at a time when computers were just coming into their prime, you know, the 1990s. We had computers in our home when most people in America didn't, for the first time, because my dad ran a computer repair shop. My brothers would, like, borrow parts from my dad that he ordered or whatever and just assemble a computer, and we'd get a web browser. We would buy DOS games to play all the time. My brother also got a an original NES from somebody in the congregation that was broken, and he had a soldering iron, and he soldered pieces together to fix the Nintendo, the NES. I think there's something wrong with the power port or something like that. He fixed it, and we had like three or four NES games we played. Mario, Duck Hunt, Baseball, and a couple of others. We were probably a little bit more entertaining and more entertained than most people in our congregation. But again, that that came at a cost. People in the congregation were wary of us. They thought that we weren't very spiritual. Most Jehovah's Witnesses will allow themselves a little bit of time to watch TV at the end of the day, as long as it's not something that is too controversial or too questionable. There was a big trend in my congregation when I was a kid of watching Friends uh, when it was coming out. And that was actually kind of controversial among some Jehovah's Witnesses. Friends was dirty sometimes, you know, it wasn't great. But my whole congregation from the 90s, they were super into that TV show. So it just kind of varies from congregation to congregation what their tolerance is for what they allow people to do for fun. I also played the Pokemon games. I had a Game Boy, so there's that. Hi, Owen. This is Christopher from Indiana. Uh, My question for you is, Uh, How do you 
or what advice would you have uh, for people coping with uh, anger and resentment as a result of actions on the church? I know that from the way that I grew up in a cult that I struggle with a lot of feelings of, you know, anger, depression, uh, resentment as a result. And I was just wondering how you cope with that or any advice you'd have for someone in that situation. Uh, Big Ten, uh, thanks so much. Bye. I know when I came out of religion, I was absolutely furious when I realized Jehovah's Witnesses were basically scamming me, taking me for every penny that I owned and taking my family away from me and everything else. I was very unhappy with that. I eventually found an outlet for that. My outlet was watching YouTubers talk about it and communicate exactly how I felt, and eventually me communicating exactly how I felt on YouTube myself. Having an outlet of some sort, having an outlet like that especially, is eternally useful. Most people who come out of religion, especially cults like we did, or like I did, I'm, I'm not sure what group you came from, most people who come out of groups like that tend to have a really, really bad attitude toward religion as a result for a long time. Like I said, I don't know what group you came from, but it is possible maybe you have religious trauma syndrome. It's like a branch of post-traumatic stress disorder. It works in similar ways. It's not just you left religion and you're upset about it. It's another level past that. And there are RTS therapists out there who can talk to you and work with you on that to try to find a solution. I'd recommend talking to one. I mean, just Google religious trauma syndrome counselors or therapists in your area, or even online. Maybe you can find some through like virtual means or whatever. Like there are a billion ways to connect with people like this, and maybe they can do some good for you. Next email is from John. Title is Televangelist Question. Hey Owen, big fan and always love listening to your videos and learning about some of the crazier stuff happening on the fringes just out of view. With how many televangelists are leaning into talking in tongues and falling out in the spirit, I've wondered how they would react if someone on their church live on air fell to the ground acting as if they were being met with a revelation only for the person to stand up and call them out. For a while, I've just pictured someone like Copeland with his strange mannerisms and short temper to snap. And sadly, I would imagine the whole room would turn on the accuser due to just how much sway he and others like him hold on their congregation. What do you imagine would happen? P.S. I'd recommend picking up the new Kirby. It makes for a great game to play with a family member while relaxing. I've heard really good things about the Kirby game, yeah. I should probably give that a shot one of these days. How would they react to being called out in person? Well, no need to wonder. We have examples of it. I mean, we, we can look at examples of people being called out, although your way is a little bit different. Your way was feigning this prophecy from God, like this revelation from God where you fall out in the spirit and, and everything else. Typically, either they ignore it or they just escort you from the room and pretend it didn't happen at all. It's really bizarre that people can stand there and see this stuff happen and understand that it's just completely fake. The falling out in the spirit, the speaking in tongues, it is not inspired of God. And they still believe this stuff, despite knowing it's all fake. How do you crack the nut? You know, how do you get through to them? It's a challenge, man. It's a challenge. Next email is from Auburn. Jehovah's Witnesses Overseas. Hey there, Owen. I was wondering if Jehovah's Witnesses have different values or rules overseas. I'm from New Zealand slash Aot Aotirio something or other. I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce that. And had a Jehovah's Witness as a part of my friend group in college, American High School. He follows almost all the rules I've heard you talk about, except that in the five years of school, he never once tried to recruit anyone or even really talk about anything Jehovah's Witness, apart from that he was one. I'd like to hear what you know on Jehovah's Witnesses around the world. Thanks. Love your stuff. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses are very uniform around the world. It does not vary from country to country, or really even from congregation to congregation. That's what makes it a cult in the first place. They're all very uniform across the board. Now, that being said, there are some cases where on a congregation level, 
some congregations are a little bit more okay with some things than others. Like some congregations were okay with Pokemon. Some were okay with Harry Potter. It just kind of depended. Depends on like the elder body, the presiding overseer and how he feels basically. And then on a family level, some families feel like it's a little bit overkill to not have friends outside of the religion. Or some feel like it's overkill to not go to college. So they're okay with it. Yeah, it'll make them a little bit more like social pariahs within the congregation, but that's okay. It's a risk worth taking to make sure the kid has a social group or has an education or whatever else. That's kind of how they view it. It, it really doesn't vary between countries. That is one of the foundational things that makes it a cult in the first place. There may be some variation between families or congregations to some degree, just a little bit, but not between countries. Anyway, thank you so much for the email. I appreciate that. I know we're staying away from the court, but isn't it funny how Justice Thomas mentioned the other marriage decisions, but conveniently left out loving the Virginia interracial marriage? Yeah, that's the interesting thing about this. Roe v. Wade wasn't just about abortion rights. It was also about privacy rights. It was based on one of the amendments that revolved around privacy. So Roe v. Wade was based on that amendment about privacy. So was Loving v. Virginia. Loving v. Virginia, of course, is the interracial marriage one that allows people of different races to get married. Lawrence v. Texas was also based on that amendment. And that one says that you're allowed to engage in acts with somebody of the same sex, basically. It goes far beyond that, but just to simplify, that's what Lawrence is. Obergefell is also based on it, and that is gay marriage. Griswold, I believe, was also based on it. That allows people to get contraception. That legalizes the ability to use contraception. Okay, so interracial marriage, gay marriage the act of being gay, using contraception, and Roe v. Wade. Those cases were all based on the precedent set in the privacy amendment that I'm talking about. Clarence Thomas specifically mentioned every one of those cases when overturning Roe v. Wade, except the interracial marriage one. He said, since we're overturning Roe v. Wade, we're going to have to revisit all of them, Lawrence, Griswold, and Obergefell. Uh, Clarence, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you're reanalyzing those, you're going to have to reanalyze Loving v. Virginia, which would invalidate your marriage, bud. The Supreme Court is not about law anymore. The Supreme Court is not about logic or reason or the social contract or any of that stuff. It is now about right-wing extremism, and nothing else. That's what it's about. So they will try, I think, to overturn the cases that Clarence Thomas specifically said he wants to overturn. I believe they're going to try to overturn the ability to get contraception. I believe they're going to try to overturn gay marriage and the act of being gay. I believe they will. But I don't think they're going after interracial marriage because that would directly affect one of the court members, and they don't care if they're hypocrites or not. It doesn't matter. All they want to do is turn the U.S. into a far-right extremist autocracy, for lack of a better term. That's what it seems like to me.